Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's tuning in. Hope you're doing well and staying safe. On behalf of BioPetro, Arab Oil and Gas Academy, Arab Garo, SPE Egypt section, I'd like to welcome you all for our second session in the course of Introduction to Well Control. Please uh, drop your quest. Don't forget to drop your questions in the Q and A section below, and please keep the chat box professional and ethical. Without further ado, now let's give a give a, wor a warm welcome to Dr. Hussein Amadi. Dr. Hussein joined Bob L. Department of Petroleum Engineering at Texas Tech University in 2014, right after com completing his PhD study in petroleum engineering at Texas Tech University. Here to Texas Tech, Dr. Ahmadi worked as a drilling engineer and a well site drilling engineer with Apache Petroparts and National Iranian Oil Company in the United States and the Middle East. His research and over educative professional experience include a focus on well bore integrity, artificial intelligence, subsurface hydrogen storage, rock mechanics, and artificial lift. Up to now, Dr. Ahmadi graduated five PhD students and is advising two PhD candidates. Additionally, Dr. Hussain graduated one master's student and is advising two master's students. Dr. Hussain has authored and co-authored 55 technical papers. He also co-authored one book chapter in Fracturing Horizontal Wells book. Dr. Hussain has filed two two U.S. patents so far and serves as the faculty advisor for Texas Tech University American Rock, Me Rock Mechanics Association. Dr. Hussein is a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers and the National Society of Petroleum Engineers. Dr. Hussein, thank you so much for coming today and the mic is yours. Thank you, Maya, for your introduction. Uh, so, this is the second session of Introduction to Well Control, and I believe uh, we finished uh, slide number uh, 14, uh, and I was talking about how a thick gas sand can cause abnormal pressure formation, as you can see here. Uh, Due to the existence of cap rock, uh, the gas section is hydraulically disconnected from the surface aquifer. And uh, that's why uh, we calculate the pressure at the gas water contact and then subtract the hydrostatic pressure to calculate the, the pressure right at the top of the gas cap. So we can basically <clears throat> plan, plan ahead to weight up uh, the mud weight prior to entering the gas bearing formation. Uh, and obviously, uh, abnormal pressure formation is, uh, is good for reservoir engineers because they find uh, uh, oil and gas, basically hydrocarbon. Uh, there are other uh, reasons why we see um, abnormal pressure formations. Uh, the next one is faulting. Uh, if faulting happens and it moves the formations upward or downward, it can cause abnormal pressure or subnormal pressure formations. Here, as we can see here, this is a reverse faulting. It happened here. So uh, it uh, basically uh, is basically, as you can see here, uh, pushed, moved uh, formation B and A upward. Uh, so when we were drilling uh, well A at 10,000 feet, the uh, pore pressure was 46.50 PSI. However, when we were drilling the, the next well, uh, on the other side of the fault, we see that the uh, required mud weight, we see the pressure, pore pressure equals to uh, 4650 PSI at 9,000 feet instead of 10,000 feet. So obviously uh, the required mud weight to drill that for uh, that section is higher, more than eight, uh, more than the density of uh, salt water. Uh, 
uh, the other reason for having abnormal pressure formation is salt domes. Uh, salt domes because of its um, intrinsic characteristics, which is plastic. Uh, it acts as like plastic, so it moves formation upwards and it can cause faulting and abnormal pressure formations. And on top of that, drilling through salt domes is, uh, is pretty challenging. Uh, erosion, if erosion happens, as you can see here between the left and the right, uh, if the original ground elevation was D sub one and after uh, erosion happened, the TBD reduces from D sub one to D sub two. So you see uh, reduction in TBD and same pressure. So by normal drilling operation, we expect a lower uh, poor pressure. However, in reality, when we start drilling, we see a higher pressure gradient. And sometimes it's man-made, uh, especially if we fail to, uh, to do the cementing job properly. And if we fail to achieve uh, proper zonal isolation, what happens, um, fluid, either hydrocarbon or brine, let's say hydrocarbon, starts uh, moving from a high pressure zone to a low pressure zone. In this case, for example, if, uh, this is the initial reservoir uh, we drill to extract oil or gas. And after uh, that uh, formation gets depleted, we decide to uh, drill deeper using the existing well or new well uh, to extract or to produce hydrocarbon from deeper formations. Uh, we know that this, this zone is depleted, so it has subnormal pressure or the very low pressure. However, if for any reason we end up uh, having poor zonal isolation here, uh, we are going to charge uh, the low pressure formation. And if we drill another well close to the existing well, uh, while entering this presumably low pressure formation, we see a high pressure, uh, higher pore pressure than we initially expected. So um, uh, kick may happen because we are not prepared based on the drilling planning. Uh, so we know about the, the reasons why uh, abnormal, pore pre uh, abnormal pressure formation may form. Um, the next the next part is how we can detect the kick. So obviously uh, we want to prevent the kick from happening. This is our primary goal. However, sometimes you fail to, to achieve this goal. So kick happens. The question is how can we detect kicks? In order to do so, we need to know about the kick indicators. Basically, kick indicators are the indicator which tells us whether kick is, is happening right, with certitude or probably a kick is happening. So based on um, the amount of uh, certainty of the indicator, we, we categorize these indicators into two main categories. The first one is positive. The second one is possible. As you can see, the names are pretty self-explanatory. Positive kick indicators are the kick in, are the indicators which, by observing them, we can say for sure, with certitude, that a kick is happening, because there is no other explanation for such phenomena. For example, if during drilling operation we notice increase in the flow out, meaning that we are pumping at certain rate, and we accept, we expect to receive the same uh, flow rate out of the well bore through the flow line. However, if uh, for, for any reason we notice that the flow, uh, flow in is less than flow out, uh, this is a positive kick indicator. Why? Because there is no other any possible explanation for this. Definitely we're uh, drilling through a closed system. So what we pump, we should get at the surface. 
to the annulus. Uh, the other one is pit gain during drilling operation as we drill deeper and deeper since we are replacing the formation and rock with drilling mud. We expect the level of the pit uh, constantly, uh, not constantly, it gets uh, dropped. Uh, if while drilling and not adding mud to the system, to the mud pit, we notice that the uh, level of the mud in the pit starts to increase. Obviously, this is another reason another indicator, positive kick indicator. And the last one is continue flowing while the pumps are off. Let's say we are going to, we already cut it down and we want to make connections. So uh, we pick up the drill string, or we turn off the pumps and we want to uh, add the stand or join the drill string. After, I mean, obviously, uh, as soon as we turn off the pump, the flow does not stop. It takes some time to see uh, no mud is coming out of the well board. However, if after pump, after turning off the pump, we notice that the, the, the well is still flowing. So mud uh, keeps coming out of the well board. This is also another uh, positive kick indicator. And this is what we were uh, we observed in the short video I showed you guys in the first session, uh, because when the pumps are off and the system is closed and no formation fluid can enter the well board, uh, the mud has to stay, the level of the mud in the well board must stay uh, constant. However, if we see mud is coming out of the well board, definitely something is pushing out the mud. So this is also a positive kick indicator. Uh, obviously the way that we treat positive kick indicators from the uh, next slide indicators, which are possible kick indicators is different. And we'll talk about them, the difference uh, shortly after finishing uh, talking about possible kick indicators. Uh, the second category, is possible uh, kick indicators. Uh, these are named possible because uh, when we see them, we cannot um, we cannot be sure that kick is happening. So uh, we need to basically do further investigation, making sure that the kick is the cause of this indicator. The first one is change in ROP because when a kick happens, we go under balance and one of the advantages of uh, underbalanced drilling over overbalanced drilling is a higher rate of penetration. However, uh, this might not be uh, always the case because rate of penetration may change or may increase when we change formation. For example, we, start, we, we finish drilling hard formation and start entering a softer formation. Obviously, ROP will increase. Or we change the drilling parameters like um, weight on bed, like RPM, like flow rate, et cetera. Uh, increase in drag and torque. Um, when uh, kick happens and the, go, and the well goes under balance, one of the downside of under balance is well bore integrity, uh, well bore stability issues, meaning that the radial stress uh, decreases and um, it may create uh, well stability issue and due, due to well stability issue, uh, the torque and drag values we are reading starts to increase. Change in the mud temperature, if mud temperature increases uh, because one of the uh, characteristics of abnormal pressure formation is uh, higher temperature, compared to other formations. If the gas content inside the drilling mud increases, that could be also another uh, sign of a kick. May change in standby pressure, more specifically decrease in this standby pressure because when a kick happens, when formation fluid starts entering the well board, uh, formation fluid is uh, lighter than the drilling mud. So basically uh, the amount of pressure we need at the surface the standby to uh, maintain the continuous flow decreases. And, uh, with the same flow rate, uh, 
with the same uh, mod and mod properties, uh, sample pressure decreases. However, it's not always uh, because of having kick. It may be because of uh, some leakage in the surface uh, line, for example. So this, what I'm trying to say is there, are, there could be other explanation or other causes for this change or drop in the sample pressure. Change in drilling mud properties like the uh, colloride content uh, or other properties of the mud because drilling mud property changes if uh, any contamination happens. <clears throat> the exponent analysis, which is basically mm, uh, related to ROP. So as we uh, drill deeper and deeper, we, we expect the, the exponent <coughs> sorry, increases, uh, any decrease or any deviation from the normal, uh, the exponent tells us about possible uh, kick is happening. Uh, the exponent or drillability exponent is defined as a uh, log of ROP over 60 RPM over log uh, 12 uh, weight on bit uh, over 10 to the power 10 to power 6 times the bit diameter. As we can see here, the units are given in field units, uh, foot per hour, pounds force, and bit diameter inches. Uh, if we want to take into account the effect of mod weight, uh, then uh, we define a new uh, variable. It's called corrected the exponent. As we can see here, it will be the exponent we calculate times uh, the normal pore pressure divided by ECD, which is the equivalent cyclic density. I already uh, talked about that. Uh, if uh, this is an example telling us when um, rate of penetration increases, the exponent or DC exponent decreases. And this is a property of uh, log. Uh, how we do that, as I mentioned, if we plot the uh, correct the uh, exponent over 30, 10 to 30 uh, intervals of a certain formation, and then we plot it, the straight line will tell us about the normal pressure, normal trend, and any deviation it tells us about uh kick so or abnormal pressure so here we see that normal trend is like this if we draw if we plot depth or tvd versus uh, dc exponent and any deviation from to the left tells us about abnormal pressure uh another uh, very important concept that uh, every single drilling engineer uh, must pay attention is mass or maximum allowable annual surface pressure uh, during uh, killing operation we always monitor the surface pressures the casing pressure or choke pressure uh, this pressure is um, important for us for several reasons because um, we want to make sure that this pressure does not exceed certain value. Uh, if it does exceed that value, then we may end up damaging either the well board, the open hole section, or the case section, or well head section. So what could have what could go wrong in the open hole section is to uh, induce uh, fracture in the weakest formation presumably right below the casing shoe, or in the case hole, it may burst the casing, or surface equipment may, it may uh, damage well head, for example. Uh, so basically mass will be determined based on these values, the, the, these three uh, factors. However, most of the time, uh, the fracture propagation pressure of the weakest formation is the determined factor. So <clears throat> uh, another uh, uh, concept that I would like to talk about is ballooning. Uh, ballooning in certain ways is uh, similar to kick. However, uh, there are certain differences between these two. Uh, 
kick basically happens when we go under balance while drilling through a permeable formation. So the permeable formation has a higher pressure than the bundle pressure. So formation fluid, either hydrocarbon or, or uh, brine starts uh, entering the well bore. And since it's permeable and we're dealing with large volume, it does, it does not stop and the situation gets uh, progressively worse. However, ballooning happens when we are drilling through very low permeable or impermeable formation. And we exceed the fracture propagation pressure of that formation. So when this happens, uh, we create induced fractures inside that impermeable formation and mud starts entering uh, those fractures or those from that formation. However, because of uh, low permeability of that specific formation, leak off does not happen. So when it does not happen, when we turn off the pump and bottom pressure goes from dynamic bottom pressure down to static bottom pressure, and the static bottom pressure is less than fracture propagation pressure, so mud starts coming back to the well bore. So it acts like a kick is happening. However, in certain things, uh, in certain aspects, these two are different. First, uh, when ballooning happens, uh, or well breathing, they call it, well ballooning, well breathing, they, are, they use in the industry interchangeably for, for this phenomenon. During drilling operation, we see uh, losing drilling fluid into formation. This is one uh, difference. However, when a kick happens, this is not the case. Secondly, uh, ballooning happens while drilling through impermeable formation, uh, while kick happens when we are drilling through permeable formations. Uh, the third one is uh, the volume of the mud or the volume we are dealing with during ballooning is significantly uh, smaller than the volume of kick because uh, presumably we only lost certain volume of the drilling fluid into that impermeable formation. So when we turn off the palm, uh, those lost mod basically come back to the formation, to the well. However, since um, in any operation, we want to make sure that safety is paramount, is the most important factor. Uh, we, we want to make sure that ballooning is kick. So initially we treat the ballooning as kick. However, if we are 100% sure that this is ballooning, then we don't need to treat it as a kick. Uh, so here in this graph, you see if we plot uh, the volume or the the volume we are getting out of the well bore versus time, initially the, um, the behaviors are almost identical. However, after a certain time, you see that uh, the, the flow rate coming out of the well bore starts uh, to decrease and basically it, flat, it flattens. Uh, why? Because as I previously mentioned, when uh, ballooning happens, only limited volume of the drilling fluid enters the formation. While kick, when kick happens, we are dealing with a large volume of formation fluid. Uh, so now we know about the, the importance of the well control, the why uh, kick happens. Uh, we know about the kick indicators and uh, also uh, we know about mass and we know about balloon. In order to be able to respond to a kick or any well control related issue, we need to first know about the equipment available on a rig. Uh, I'm going to talk about what equipment are, uh, are available on a drilling rig, a standard drilling rig, and what are the functions of those uh, equipment. Uh, basically, when a kick happens, uh, to prevent that from becoming a blowout, we need to make sure that we contain the formation fluid inside the well. And in order to do that, uh, we need to prevent the formation fluid from reaching the surface in an uncontrolled manner. 
For a formation fluid to reach the surface, uh, basically it has two options. The first option is annulus. The second option is through the drill string. However, uh, annulus is the, pre the preferred uh, path for formation fluid uh, because uh, it's the least resistant path for the formation fluid. Uh, how and um, through the drilling string, uh, if the analyst is sealed and is blocked, then the second choice will be the drilling string through the drilling string. So we need to have some type of equipment to basically seal both inside uh, the drilling string and the annulus. So inside the, I'll start with the drilling string. Um, Right above the drilling mod inside the bit sub, we do have float valve. Float valve is basically a valve, one-way valve. It allows the uh, drilling fluid to go, to pass through it. And it gets open when the pressure above the valve exceeds the pressure below the valve. So the valve gets open and we see for uh, drilling mod uh, going out through it. Uh, and also we have, Another valve at the surface, we call a surface safety valve, which is a ball type valve at the surface. So if in case kick happens and the float valve uh, fails to function, we can close the surface safety valve, uh, which is a ball type valve manually. For annulus, in order to seal the annulus and prevent the formation fluid from reaching the surface, we have basically blowout preventer. So BOP is, um, is the main and probably the most important uh, piece of equipment we have available on a drilling rig. And we need to make sure that this uh, equipment works uh, flawlessly. Uh, BOP basically consists of several uh, valves, rams, and it seals the, the annulus. Uh, we have choke manifold, uh, which basically reduces the pressure of uh, uh, the fluid coming out of the well wall when we do the killing operation. We have kill line and choke line. Kill line, if we want to uh, pump kill mod uh, through the annulus, and the choke line, when the mod coming out of the mod or formation fluid coming out of the well board, it comes through the choke line. And accumulator or comb unit, which is the commercial name of the accumulator, is a piece of equipment used to hydraulically close and open BOP components, kill line, choke line, and hydraulic remote uh, controller, HCR. Uh, HR, hydraulic control remote HCR valves. Uh, this is uh, the picture of float valve. As you can see here, uh, it gets open when the mod is coming out of it. And uh, when we stop pumping, it gets closed. When a kick happens, when we stop pumping, since the pressure below it, below the valve exceeds the pressure inside the valve, so it gets closed and it will be uh, housed inside the bit sub. Uh, the Kelly safety valve or the ball valve, as you can see here, they do it, uh, it's a ball type valve and they close and open it manually using this wrench. Uh, so this, uh, this basically show us how it operates when it's open and when it's closed. Uh, basically is a sphere and there's a path, it's hollow sphere. And if the, the path is aligned with the path of the flow, then the valve is open. If it's not, the valve is closed. Uh, it's different from the gate valve, which is uh, common in the production engineering, for example, master valve, bottom and top master valve. This is a, a picture of the BOP, a BOP stack, as you can see here is gigantic. Uh, it's not a small piece of equipment, and uh, this specific one has three rams, two pipe rams, one shear ram, and one annual preventer. 
I'll talk about each component in detail in the future slides. So annual preventer basically uh, is like donut. So it's made of uh, elastometer or rubber. Uh, it may or may not have a lower pressure rating than other components of the BOP, meaning uh, pipe ram and shear or blind ram. And uh, since it's made of uh, elastometer or rubber, it can basically can basically close it against any cross-sectional area, so it seals it. Uh, we can even close it again when the pipe uh, there's no pipe inside the well bore. However, it's not recommended because it may damage the uh, the rubber, and we can. If we want to close the pipe, close the BOP when there's no pipe, uh, it is recommended to close the shear pipe, shear ram or, or blind ram. And as I mentioned, every single component of a BOP stack is hydraulically activated uh, using uh, annual uh, accumulator. And here we can see this is the, the rubber part. Um, this is when it uh, want, we want to close it. We, this part moves upward, pushes the uh, pushes the rubber inward, and we want to close it. The uh, the yellow part moves downward, and it uh, the last no, the, the rubber part moves outward, so it gets open. Uh, pipe ram, as we can see here, is made of steel and um, rubber so the body is made of steel and the edges are made of rubber uh, depending whether it's fixed or uh, adjustable if it's fixed for example we can only close this uh, we can only close it against a certain cross-sectional area so what we do we close it against the body of the pipe not the tool joint uh, as i previously mentioned this is the picture of it. So this is, for example, a, a fixed RAM. Uh, it can only be close against certain cross-sectional area. Uh, it's uh, steel and rubber. Uh, usually it has a higher pressure rating than annual preventer, but it might not necessarily be the case. Uh, and because of its specific sh shape, it can only uh, seal the specific pipe size. And as I previously mentioned, like uh, annual preventer, it's hydraulically activated. Uh, the third component of a BOP is a blind or shear ram. And we do that, we close or we operate this part as the last resolution. If we have uh, no other option, then we close shear or blind ram because it basically damages uh, the pipe permanently, and we don't want this to be our first resolution. Uh, like pipe ram, we only close uh, shear or blind ram against the body of the pipe because uh, the body of the pipe is thinner compared to the uh, tool joint. And if we close it against the tool joint, uh, it does not uh, shear the pipe and we may have catastrophe like McCandle back in 2010. Uh, this is a closer picture of a shear ram. As you can see here, it's made of uh, steel. Uh, it has same pressure rating as the pipe ram usually and shear the drill pipe and like pipe ram and uh, annual preventer, uh, it's hydraulically activated. Uh, this is uh, a short video of the annual preventer. I'm not going to play that, but you can simply search on uh, YouTube and you can find it uh, talking about the different components of uh, BOP preventer. I mean, 
I'm not doing that for the sake of the, uh, saving some time. So we move faster. Uh, the other component that uh, we have on a drilling rig is a choke manifold. As you can see here, choke uh, manifold is made of uh, some gauges uh, and uh, valves and different paths. So when we, when the fluid comes out of the wellbore drilling mod or uh, formation fluid, it enters this and we have different path, uh, different paths in case there's any leak and we have different uh, valves and also chokes different choke sizes here. Uh, so as I previously mentioned, uh, it has sets of uh, valves or chokes. And basically we use, um, we use these, this piece of equipment to control the pressure from the well head. And uh, we have uh, fixed chokes uh, on that. Uh, the next piece of equipment we have is hydraulic control unit or accumulator. So basically the accumulator is used to both close and open uh, BOP components. Uh, as you can see here, you see uh, certain motors and uh, cylinders, gauges, handles, uh, so these handles are used to close and open uh, different components of a BOP. These uh, cylinders, um, they host hydraulic oil and compressed uh, nitrogen. So what we do here, what we have it here, we have compressed nitrogen at the top part of uh, these cylinders and we have compressed hydraulic oil at the bottom. So when we open the valve, uh, so what happens, the nitrogen gas inside the, uh, inside the cylinder expands and pushes the hydraulic oil out of the cylinder, provides the hydraulic uh, power required to either close or open um, different parts of BOP. Uh, based on API standard, uh, the amount uh, should be sufficient to fully close and open all components of the BOP, all the RAMs, uh, twice. So this is API standard. And uh, on rig, they always uh, regularly uh, test uh, both uh, accumulator and BOP, making sure that uh, they are uh, functional. As I mentioned previously, uh, it's uh, accumulator is used to close and open rams, uh, annual preventer, HCR, high pressure, and they are basically high pressure cylinders uh, containing hydraulic fluid and nitrogen. And based on APR RO53, they have to have total volume as at least two times. Uh, so these are the a summary of the equipment available on a standard drilling rig. Uh, now, if a kick happens, what steps we need to take to prevent uh, the incident we, we saw in the first session? So, If we are positive that the kick is happening, meaning that uh, either a positive kick indicator has been observed, or for some reason we are positive that kick is happening. What we do that, <clears throat> uh, we, 
pick up the drill string from the bottom. So uh, stop, basically we call it space out. Uh, we uh, stop pumping, rotating, and then we close the BOP. So the order is to pick up the drill string, uh, stop pumping and close BOP. Obviously, there is a reason why we have to do that in this order, and this is the correct order. We do a space out just to make sure that uh, only the body of the drill pipe or the pipe is in front of the BOP. So when we close any component of the BOP, we don't close it against the tool joint. We close them against the body. Why? Because if we close, for example, pipe ram against the tool joint, especially if you are having, uh, if we close the pipe ram against the tool joint, we know that it does not seal. If uh, for some reason uh, we have to close the shear ram and the shear ram cannot uh, cut the pipe on the tool joint. So this is the reason we have to pick up the drill string first, we call it the space out. Second, uh, we have to uh, stop pumping, so stop the mud pumps and then close the BOP. The question may ask, so why we should uh, pick up the drill string first and then turn on the uh, pumps, turn off the pumps. Why don't we turn off the pumps and then pick up the drill string? Obviously closing BOP must be the last step in this operation. Uh, <clears throat> to answer this question, if you guys ask this question, why this should be in, in such order? One, pick up the drill string, two, close the, uh, turn off the pump, three, close the BOP. Why don't we turn off the pump, uh, space out, and then close the BOP? Uh, <clears throat> the answer would be when a kick happens, we have basically uh, two uh, uh, main goals. The, the first one is to safely close the bio, uh, close the well while minimizing the amount of formation fluid entering the well bore. Because the less the formation fluid enters the well bore, the easier the, the killing operation becomes. Uh, so if instead of, let's say we have two different scenarios in the, in the first scenario, I'm just exaggerating and, and throwing numbers. So in the first uh, scenario, uh, only one gallon of gas formation, let's say formation for this gas, one gallon of gas enters the well bore. And the second scenario, we have 10 gallons of, well, uh, of gas entering the well bore. Obviously handling one gallon of gas formation gas is uh, substantially easier than handling 10 gallons of uh, formation gas. And we know that the, the amount of formation fluid entering the well bore is a function of, uh, it basically is a function of uh, all the factors affecting Darcy's law, the flow rate. So <clears throat> we know that when we talk about Darcy's law, uh, the flow rate has a direct uh, relationship with the amount of uh, uh, pressure difference. So <clears throat> the differential pressure between the formation and the bottom hood obviously affects the flow rate and consequently the amount of formation fluid entering the water. We know that always uh, dynamic bottom hole pressure is more than static bottom hole pressure. So when the pumps are on, the bottom hole pressure is equal to dynamic bottom hole pressure. So we are less under balance than when the pumps are off. So for this reason, we want to keep the pump on till the last second to minimize the amount of under balance. And as a result, to minimize, to minimize the amount of formation, the volume of formation fluid can enter the wall. So basically, uh, that is the reason why we have to follow this procedure, this certain procedure. After uh, 
successfully closing the BOP and closing the wall board, obviously we check the uh, flow line, making sure that no more uh, the the uh, well, uh, the BOP is functioning properly. So basically, it seals the annulus. Then we calculate the pit gain, <clears throat> meaning that how much the the volume, how much volume of mud came back to the uh, mud pit. Why? Because it tells us how much formation fluid into the well bore, pushing this much mud out of the well bore. So this is very important to calculate the amount of formation fluid already entered the well bore. Then we start recording casing pressure uh, and uh, to, to, to calculate casing shutting pressure. Basically, we have two uh, gauges. We have one gauge on the annulus, we call it casing pressure or choke pressure, and one, one gauge at the surface on the rig floor, we call the standby pressure. When we turn off the pump, standby pressure should be reading zero because uh, now we have no uh, circulation and the valve is closed, uh, float valve is closed, so we don't see the difference, the effect of the formation pressure or bottom pressure at the surface. However, this is not the case with the casing pressure because inside the annulus, we have no, uh, no barrier all the way up to the surface, meaning the BOP. So what happens is uh, we see the difference between the bottom wall pressure and hydrostatic pressure inside the annulus. And all, sorry, and always casing pressure or choke pressure at the surface tells us, tells us about the difference between the bottom wall pressure, whatever bottom wall pressure is, and hydrostatic pressure inside the annulus. When a kick happens and we close the BOP, bottom wall pressure uh, is less than formation pressure. And for this reason, uh, formation fluid can enter the well. When we close the BOP, formation fluid does not stop entering well bore instantly because the reason to have flow is the pressure differential and bottom wall pressure is less than formation pressure so formation fluid keeps entering the well bore till the bottom wall pressure becomes equal to formation pressure on the other word we reach pressure equilibrium when the pressure equilibrium is reached then no more formation fluid can enter the well bore so <clears throat> when we close the BOP, bottom wall pressure, since formation pressure, formation fluid keeps entering the well bore, bottom wall pressure keeps increasing till it reaches a point that bottom wall pressure becomes equal to formation pressure. And at that point, we call that case, at that point, uh, the, the pressure we are recording, we are reading, at the casing pressure or choke pressure, we call it casing shot in pressure. So basically casing shot in pressure is the pressure at which formation fluid stops entering the wall bore. We're reading from the casing pressure. If the formation uh, fluid is oil and the difference, oil is slightly compressible and the density difference between oil and drilling mud is, is not significant, so oil basically remains at the bottom of the well bore. However, if the formation fluid is gas, the story is completely different. Why? Because gas density, let's say is two, three pounds per gallon, and we're drilling with 10 or 11 pounds per gallon. So the density difference is significant, eight, seven, nine um, gallons per, uh, pounds per gallon, sorry. So in this case, because of the density difference, the gas, the formation gas stops entering the well bore. So no more formation gas can enter the well bore. However, the gas itself does not stay at the bottom of the well bore. 
Why? Because of the significant uh, density difference between the gas and the drilling one. So what happens, the gas bubble starts migrating. And uh, I think it's pretty obvious why this happens. So gas uh, keeps migrating and the casing, shelly pressure, casing pressure keeps increasing. Uh, the, the second, the, the next step we need to take, uh, we need to, we need to calculate drill pop shot impression. Drill pop shot impression is basically uh, the difference between the hydrostatic pressure and the formation pressure. So the amount of pressure we are, were under balance in the static condition when the kick happened. So we should know how much we were under balance. In order to do so, uh, we cannot use the casing pressure to calculate that because uh, we don't know about the density of the formation fluid. So what we do, we start, uh, we use the standby pressure. So we start pumping drilling mud at a very slow rate, maybe two, three, five strokes per minute uh, through the drill string. And since initially the pressure at the top of the float valve is, is lower than the pressure below the float valve because of the kick, so we are pumping inside a closed system and the pressure, standby pressure keeps increasing because we are basically pumping inside the, inside the closed system. However, at some point, the pressure right above the valve, which is equal to hydrostatic pressure inside the drill string plus the pressure uh, we are reading at the surface standby pressure exceeds the formation pressure. So the valve gets open. That pressure can be calculated and uh, is, a, is drill pipe shutting pressure. So drill pipe shutting pressure is basically used to calculate uh, the kill mud density because drill pipe shutting pressure plus hydrostatic pressure due to mud tells us about formation pressure. So we add drill pipe shutting pressure to hydrostatic pressure and calculate the formation pressure. Uh, using uh, formation pressure, we can calculate kick density using safety factor if we want. Uh, by knowing the, the volume of the pit gain and knowing the uh, cross-sectional area and geometry of the uh, well bore, the annulus, we should be able to calculate the height of the kick or influx simply by dividing the pit gain by cross section area. So we can calculate the height of the kick and by knowing the height of the kick, we should be able to calculate the density of the kick or density of the influx. And by knowing the density of the influx, we can calculate, we can determine the type of formation fluid, whether it's oil, brine, or gas. Obviously, if it has uh, low uh, density, like two, three, or four, or four pounds uh, per gallon is gas. If it's more than that, less than eight probably is oil. And if it's more than nine, it's brine. Uh, also, the, the knowledge we have about the field we are drilling the well in, uh, can help us to determine, can help us determine the, the type of the formation fluid. Uh, and uh, and then we will calculate the initial circulating pressure and final circulating pressure and calculate the, the volume of the releasing and annulus to uh, to generate the kill sheet. Uh, I will, I'll stop here and uh, give five minutes to answer any question or questions you may have.
is there any question? Uh, Dr. Hussain, yes, there's a question, someone asking, what is the function of the remote choke valve? Remote choke valve? Yes. Uh, remote choke valve. Uh, choke valve is basically, choke valve is basically used when we are going to have, uh, we want to circulate the formation fluid out of the well bore. So the choke valve needs to get open. So the, uh, the formation fluid go through the choke manifold. Okay, this is the only question we uh, received related to the subject, so you can uh, go ahead. Okay, so this was the only uh, question. Uh, the initial circulating pressure and final circulating pressure, let me talk about them. Uh, when we calculate the, uh, the casing shutting pressure and the rear pipe shutting pressure, uh, we should be able, we should know how much pressure we need uh, to to establish the circulation because uh, after doing the calculations the main goal of the well killing operation is first of all to circulate out the formation fluid and then to replace the current mod which is uh, too light to drill that formation based on the incident uh, to replace that mod with a kill mod, which is heavy enough to, uh, to prevent the formation from flowing. Uh, so initial circulating pressure, the pressure we need to read at uh, standby pressure obviously should be equal to uh, drill pipe shutting pressure because this is the pressure is required to open the valve. Plus, <clears throat> so, by applying that pressure, the pressure, shutting pressure, the valve, the full valve gets open. And after that, we can have the continuous circulation. In order to have a continuous circulation, uh, we need to overcome the pressure drop due to friction inside the system, which is drill string, drill bit, and annulus. This is initial circulating pressure. Final circulating pressure is when we have kill mod. So the current mod has been already replaced by kill mod inside the annulus. Uh, this is basically the pressure drop due to friction when we have kill mod in order to have a continuous uh, circulation. Uh, calculate the, the volume, the drill string and annulus volume is pretty straightforward. So we need to know the volume of the drill string and uh, annulus. Uh, these values are needed when we want to perform uh, the circulations, implementing either weight and weight or driller's method. Uh, so we need to know how much mod, how much volume of mod, current mod or kill mod we need to pump to make sure, for example, kick uh, for influx is completely out of the world war or uh, to replace the current mod with the kill mod. Uh, uh, after um, calculating the volume of drill string and the um, uh, after calculating the volume of the drill string, we can calculate the number of strokes uh, we require to replace the current mod inside the and drill string with the kill mod. And also the, the amount of uh, strokes we need to fully replace the current mod with the kill mod. Uh, so to generate the kill sheet, uh, uh, I will talk about that in the future session. It's five, so I'll stop here now. Any more questions? Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, yes, we have uh, questions. What's the function of remote chalk valve? Uh, 
I already <laughs> answered this question. Ah, Dr. Ahmed already asked me and I already asked, answered this well, question. Maya, let, let me help you, Maya. I mean, I can ask uh, a question you can ask the next uh, from the um, uh, chat box. There's a question okay. someone asking about uh, both water and gas and oil uh, kick is undesirable. According to you, which is more dangerous? Uh, definitely gas because of the nature of the gas. Uh, it's highly compressible and also very low density. So it's, it's much more challenging to handle than oil and brine. And uh, another one, why the mud is bomb at low rate? Uh, when we want to calculate the uh, gel pipe shutting pressure because, uh, because the lower uh, the rate, the lower the change in the pressure. And the lower the change in the pressure, the easier to uh, accurately determine the oil pipe shutting pressure. Okay. Um, what is the difference between the shear ram and blind ram and their functions? Okay, but shear ram and pipe and blind ram. Uh, shear basically it, it shears the pipe. Blind basically is blind the pipe, so it does not shear it. Uh, both of them are the last resolution, and uh, on the rig we have only one type of either. The shear ram or blind ram. Okay, let me uh, get this question for you. Uh, someone asking about uh, uh, what is the difference between, no, no, not this one. Uh, during the kill, if we space out, I mean, okay. we stop drilling and rotation. Uh, is it any chance for the pipe to get stuck because we there is no rotation? Uh, usually, it's very low. the 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 chance is is extremely low. However, when you space out, uh, you don't necessarily need to st stop rotating. You can rotate and space out, and then you pump. Uh, you turn off the pump. And the last question, what, which method will the efficient will the efficient during well killing to increase the mud weight of all the mud system or replace the mud with kill mud? Which method? I will talk about the kill, well killing method in the next uh, session, hopefully. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hussein, again. And to, and to highlight, this session has been uploaded and will be, and will be, um, has been recorded and will be uploaded soon on PyoPatro YouTube channel. So make sure to subscribe on our channel. I hope you a good day and bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.